Good morning, Crossroads. Ah, you are sounding good. You are looking good. Are you ready for 2022? All right. All right. My name is John. Just an incredible, incredible delight. You know what? Yesterday's gone. We aren't promised tomorrow, but you know one of the greatest gifts we begin, we've been given is today. And I believe there's a reason why you're here in Goshen, if you're in St. Pete, Mishawaka, online. I don't know what brought you, but we are together today, various locations, one church, and I believe there's something unique and special. If your heart is open, if your ears are ready to receive what God wants to do in your life, I believe there's something powerful that he wants to teach you. We are starting off 2022 with a bang here at Crossroads. We are looking at a series called Dangerous Prayers. Who knew? Who knew that prayer could be dangerous? That's typically not the word that comes to our mind when we think about prayer, is it? When we think about prayer, we probably think more about peace, encouragement, you know, enlightening, helpful, but but dangerous, that's not a word that we typically will associate with prayer. Have a video clip just to kind of introduce this topic a little bit further. When we think of a wedding dance, we think of romance and love and laughter and celebration. Have a video clip from a recent wedding dance, the bride's ex-boyfriend shows up uninvited, and before the first dance happens, he grabs the microphone, and, and there's a little interesting uh, situation that takes place. So I've got a, a short clip to show you this. So there's the groom and this former boyfriend, and all of a sudden, it, it's going to get it's going to get interesting here. <laughs> <laughs> now, isn't that a great way to start off a marriage right there? You know, altercation at the wedding dance. Who knew? Who knew that a wedding dance could be dangerous? Well, I don't know if you picked up on it or not, but I'll let you in on a little secret. That was actually a, it was a prank, all right? The, the, Bride is actually a big pro wrestling fan, and so as a gift, the groom actually found that dude that had a background in pro wrestling, and so they practiced that skit hours and hours and hours, and he taught him how to build a table that collapses like that, so that was all a setup. That was a way of the groom saying, congratulations for marrying me. Isn't that just amazing right there? <laughs> now you know what to get your next family member that gets married, all right? Let you in on another secret. If you are committed to growing in your faith, if you are committed to being more Christ-like today than you were yesterday, if, if you are determined to pursue the very best that God has designed and created you for, your prayers should be and will be dangerous at times. Think about it. See, uh, uh, an immature follower of Christ only sees prayer as kind of a request to God. And that's a part of prayer. God, would you, I've got a doctor's appointment coming up. God, I, boy, would you help me? I applied for this new job. and God, you know I need a new vehicle, so will you kind of give me direction? And, and so we present our request to God, and that is definitely a very important. God wants to know what's going on. But God is more than kind of this vending machine that we kind of, what is it like, you know, $3.50 for a 12-ounce can of Coke now, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> and some people, that's as far as their prayer life goes, is they just kind of, they put their money in and they select what they want and they hope that God delivers. But friends, check it out. If you're committed to growing Christ-like, prayer also involves listening. Prayer also involves surrendering, aligning your heart with the heart of God. And that can be dangerous. <laughs> that can be dangerous so today we're going to look at a prayer 
that uh, King David wrote in the Bible that, uh, man, I'm hoping all of you, at least this next week, that that you will pray this prayer at least five times every day this week (laughs) and just see what the Lord may do. It's it's a game changer. It's, It's dangerous. It's a dangerous prayer, but in a really, really good way. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but most of the best things in life are dangerous. I mean, had a little fun with the wedding dance, but if you think about it, marriage is dangerous. I mean, to come before a pastor or a priest and look someone else in the eye and say, for better, for worse, and for richer, for poorer, and sickness, and in health, that's dangerous. Like, like I don't know about you, but... I know, I know for my wife, Terry, sometimes I'm probably more worse than I am better. <laughs> and there's times I'm, I'm probably more sick than I am healthy, and <laughs> there certainly have been times that I'm more poor than I am rich. <laughs> and how about having kids? Talk about danger. I mean, that's dangerous. In fact, the prayer we're going to look at today by King David, he lived about a 1,000 years before Jesus was born, so about 3,200, uh, about 3,020 years roughly ago. And uh, he had a number of children, and one of his sons actually uh, raped his half sister, David's daughter. And, and so one of David's other sons actually pursued him and killed him. And then three, day, three years later, that son that killed the brother actually rebelled against David and tried overthrowing him. I mean, you talk about danger. Having kids can be dangerous. And think about it. Flying is dangerous. Mountain climbing is dangerous. I mean, crocheting can be dangerous, right? Our son on Friday, he, he calls us and he says, man, I, and, and, and we were actually in a meeting and when we got out, he had texted my wife, uh, he had texted Terry and said, uh, something about SOS, I need you for 10 minutes. We're like, what in the world happened? And, and when we, he says, I need to uh, be on a video call, and, and he says, uh, they just bought a new house. He and his wife live in Colorado, and, and he had to build a handle for some, some device that he was working on, and so he, he needed to whittle it with his knife, and as he was whittling it, uh, his knife whittled into his leg. <laughs> And he shows us his pants were all full of blood, and so his wife was coming, and he said, I just wanted to make sure if you would just stay on the phone with me for 10 minutes until Alexis gets here. And we're just like, thanks a lot. Couldn't you just, like, call us when you get a raise at work or something like that? Like, (laughs) I mean, kids can be dangerous. Many of the best things in life, if you think about it, are are dangerous. And so in Psalm 139, the prayer we're going to look at, David is under attack from God's enemies and they're questioning his motives and his character. And in the middle of all this stress and this, this difficult situation, David acknowledges God's faithfulness and God is his creator. And he ends this chapter, Psalm 139, with one of the most humble and non-defensive and just dangerous Dangerous prayers. And so let's read this prayer out loud together in Mishawaka and St. Pete. If you're at home, read it out loud with me. And here in Goshen, can we all read this together? Psalm chapter 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's a dangerous prayer. We're going to break it down into four segments. The first one is, search me, God, and know my heart. Search me, God. Know my heart. Why would we ever ask God to search our hearts? Well, here's one way I will explain it. I, uh, for about the last 10 years, uh, as I led organizations, I kept a beach ball on my desk. And I did this for a number of reasons. Uh, Sometimes there would be two people that would be uh, uh, in disagreement over a topic, and so they would come in and we'd talk through it. And and sometimes the reason the disagreement was is because I see yellow and green, and what color do you see? Yeah, you see white, and I'm like, you're crazy. There's no white. 
Or you would say blue, and I'd be like, no, 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 this is yellow and green. Go pack, go. Like, you guys are going to get me distracted. I'm uh, <laughs> uh, later in, uh, actually on Super Bowl Sunday, I'm preaching, I'm speaking at another church in Illinois, and uh, we're doing the fruit of the Spirit like we did here at Crossroads last summer, and, and I'm preaching on goodness. And I told them the, the reason I'm preaching on goodness is because on Super Bowl Sunday, we all have to admit some of us root for good teams and some of us don't. So, I mean, whatever. Take that for whatever that is worth. All right, moving along. But I keep a beach ball at my desk to help us see we do need the, we need the opinions of others. Do you know that physically we can only see 60% of our body? And so I keep a beach ball to remind myself that I, 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 need, I, need God's, I need God's perspective in my life or I'm going to screw things up really quick. And I do need the perspective of other people who are running towards God. I, I need their wisdom. I, I need their input in my life. What about my heart? What about my heart? Search me, oh God. Know my heart. Oh, friends. I'm sure you don't have this issue, but my heart can be deceitful. In fact, Jeremiah chapter 17, Old Testament prophet, he says, the heart is deceitful above all things. It's beyond cure. Who can understand it? And God says to Jeremiah in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. And so then Jeremiah declares in verse 14, heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. So why would we ever ask God to search our hearts? Because our hearts are deceitful. We can be master manipulators. And so often we hide our hearts, not just from God or from others. We actually hide our hearts from ourselves. And so physically, we can only see 60% of our body I'm not sure that we can see 60% of our heart. I don't know what the percentage is, but I think it's maybe 50, 40, maybe even 30%. And so without the Holy Spirit working in our heart, we will deceive ourselves time and time again. Do you know who you and I lie to the most? It's ourselves. It's ourselves. <laughs> Let me give you some examples. Oh, no, yeah. you know what? Everybody else lies to their customers in order to make, you know, a sale and higher commission. So, you know what? As long as I don't hurt anyone, I'm not that far out of bounds. Everybody else does this. My competitors are doing this, so I need to do this. You know, I can handle one drink. I've, you know, it's never been a big problem in my life. I mean, a few times, but I can handle it. <laughs> I don't struggle with pride. I'm just good at what I do, and I just don't have the problems that other people have. <laughs> I mean, like, I hang out with people that really have problems. I don't have any problems. <laughs> well, I don't lust. It's okay to look as long as you don't touch. <laughs> you know, one of the finest culinary blessings in the life, Golden Corral, right? <laughs> it's okay to walk through the dessert line, you know, as long as I only pick one. <laughs> I'm not materialistic. I just like nice things. Oh, oh they last longer. And yeah, I, I replace my furniture every five years, but hey, I always donate my used items to, to someone that needs them or to the thrift store. I'm not a gossip. I just think it's important that everyone stays informed. <laughs> the heart is deceitful above all things. I, the Lord, search the heart. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. As humans, all of us should be awarded an honorary law degree. We are really, really good at collecting evidence to justify our behavior and to place the blame for our actions on someone else. I have an uncle, my Uncle Mel, who was a pastor for many, many years, and 
He, uh, he passed away about six, seven years ago, and man, I miss him a ton. He was a, he was a wise mentor in my life, and I learned a lot from him. And I remember uh, maybe uh, I was uh, pretty newly married. I was probably in my mid, mid-20s, mid and uh, I remember he sat me down, and, and uh, he said, you know, John, uh, as humans, we're always trying to build our case. And I didn't fully understand at the time, and then he explained it to me, and so I'm, I'm going to explain it to you. And uh, I didn't fully understand at the time, but man, what is this, you know? Maybe, hypothetically, 30 years later, um, I still remember it, and I think about it. And he said, John, as humans, we're always building our case. So, for example, we, we're going to do something, or we're going to buy something, and so we build our case as to why it's okay to do this or to buy this or whatever it is. And so it goes something like, you know what? This person hurt me. Uh, this wasn't fair. My spouse is always so dra- distracted and they don't listen to me. So I'm going to go buy a new vehicle to kind of ease my pain because I got all this stuff going on. Or, you know what? That's why, that's why I head out to the bar on whatever, Thursday nights. And yeah, I occasionally have too much to drink, but that's my way of coping, and and I'm not doing anything illegal. And so we decide in our minds we're going to do something, and we build our case as to why it's okay that we do this. I can already tell none of you can relate to this. I'm just up here talking to myself, so that's all right. So sometimes we build our case before we go do something. (laughs) I would contend. You ready for this? I would contend that if we're already building our case, we already know that we shouldn't do this. Just a thought to lighten up the mood here in the room. The second thing we do is after we do something, we build our case why we don't need to apologize. We build our case why it wasn't that far out of bounds. Let me give an illustration. I mean, my boss is a pain. Come home from work and... My daughter's left the basketball in the garage, so I, I, and my son has gotten into my tools, and I've got tools that normally are all organized, and they're a little scattered, and so I get out of the car, and I've got to move the basketball, and I've got to put those tools back where they're supposed to go, and so then when I walk into the house, whatever, I'm five minutes late, and supper was ready, and my wife kind of needles me a little bit about being late, and I just erupt and I blow up at her. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you know what, if she knew, if she knew everything, you know, my boss ticked me off and, you know, a stupid driver that was on their phone and the light turns green and they don't go and, you know, and the kids leave stuff in the garage and so I'm late walking in and she needles me and I'm justified in blowing up. Can any of you relate? to this. And so we build our case in our mind (laughs) why it is that it wasn't that unusual or out of bounds, and so we don't ever apologize. Friends, listen, instead of justifying our actions, we need to plead with God to search our hearts. We need to ask him to be intimately familiar with what's really going on. Because just like this beach ball, I cannot see all of my heart. I need the Holy Spirit to enlighten me on what my, how my heart is deceiving myself. And so when you ask God to search your heart, it's dangerous. Because God's going to show you some impurities. He may show you how you still have bitterness at how someone wronged you. Maybe you are struggling with lust or pride. And God doesn't do this to be cruel or demanding and say, hey, look how you're falling short. No, 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 no. God does this so that he can bring you closer to him so that you can develop a healthier relationship with yourself and with other people. You are loved. And God loves you enough not to leave you where you are. I don't know about you, but man, I want to be closer to God in 2022 than I was in 2021. I want to be more Christ-like Not just spinning externally the actions, but actually for God to inspect my heart 
and to be Christ-like at the core of who I am. So I don't know about you, but I need God to further transform and mature and, and heal my heart so that I can grow healthier personally and so that I can truly love all of you as Jesus loves you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God, reveal my fears. Because God, as I've asked you to search my heart, I have to admit that fear plays a much bigger factor than what I can see. What is it? What is it that makes you internally afraid? Is it loneliness? Is it embarrassment? Is it a fear of being abandoned? I've struggled with that my whole life. My dad died unexpectedly when I was 18 months old. I was in a very vulnerable trust versus mistrust, according to the psychologist's theories. And so when my dad never came home as an 18-month-old, I didn't understand it, but my trustometer was broken. So I have a huge fear of being abandoned. It's very hard for me to trust God and to trust people. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. Fear of being hurt, fear of the future, fear of loss. Some of you grew up in homes where your mom or your dad were those folks that you could never please or perhaps trust was violated intentionally or unintentionally and so you hold people at a distance. You're so afraid of letting someone in close and getting hurt again. Friends, listen to this. What we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. You tell me your fears, I tell you my fears. We can breathe hope into each other because we've actually indicated where it is that we trust God the least. Ask God to reveal where you're anxious so that he can show you what's truly going on in your heart. Based on my father's death, um, for me, uh, I felt like we were very poor growing up. Uh, I lived in a house that was on the wrong side of the tracks. I went to the grade school that everyone said, look out for the kids to go to Webster Elementary School. I was embarrassed by the bike I rode because it was too small for me. I got teased about my clothes. I would have holes in my jeans, my shoes. I only got one pair of jeans or two pair of jeans and a pair of shoes every September and they were supposed to last the whole school year. And as I grew, sometimes they would be too short. And back in my day, kids would look at each other and if you had short jeans on, you'd be like, oh, you're preparing for a flood? If you had holy jeans, that was, you know, who knew? Now it's like you pay more money for short jeans and holy jeans. Like, I was just ahead of my time. I didn't know. <laughs> and so, friends, uh, it's very easy for me to build my security around money because I associate a lot of my pain in childhood with our lack of money. <laughs> and so when Pastor Tim Fisher challenges us to be generous, I'm like, preach it, brother. I need to hear that. I need to practice that. It's so easy for me to obsess about money. I've got spreadsheets after spreadsheets, and I'm calculating, and I could crazy. And I can very slowly creep into where I build my my hope and I build my security on money. And this very it's a fear. It's a fear of being poor. It's it's a fear of being stuck in a situation that I can't control. So I would highly encourage you every day this week that you would pray this prayer. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. David is saying, God, would you reveal my sin? It takes courage. It takes audacity. God, show me everything in my life that is inconsistent with who you created me to be. 
Show me anything that breaks your heart that I'm doing, that I'm thinking. Show me where I am living my life in error. I need your truth. I'm grateful for your grace. I need oodles of grace and I need oodles of truth because I will quickly make a mess of things when I operate out of what my will is. Oh God, I want your will. Is there any offensive way in me? So Pastor Craig Rochelle from uh, Life Church, uh, he's, I've heard him talk about this several times and he's written on this. He says there are three questions that we should ask ourselves as we pray, uncover my sins. The first question is, what is it that other people are telling me? <laughs> John, you're not a good listener. I can tell that your mind's thinking on other things. I, hypothetically speaking, I've had my wife tell me that a number of years ago, and I had someone in a work setting tell me that a number of years ago, and I get defensive, but perhaps there's a reason why two different people have told me the same thing. Could the Holy Spirit be saying, <laughs> you need to ha have ears to listen, not get defensive, but receive and ask the Lord if there's a way that he wants me to grow and to mature? What is it that others are telling me? What is it that I've rationalized for some time? What is it that you're convinced? It's not a big deal, John. I'm telling you, it's not a big deal. A lot of people struggle with this issue. Hey, it's how God made me. Hey, it's how I was raised as a kid. This is all I know. Search me, oh God. Know my heart. Test my anxious thoughts. See, is there any offensive way in me? And where is it that I am the most defensive. Where is it that you steer the conversation away? <laughs> Where is it that when one of your pastors speak on this subject, you get ticked? You know, I used to joke with our church. Whenever I would speak about money, whoever it was that would get ticked, I kind of knew what they were struggling with. <laughs> it was crazy. After I said that, no one ever said, oh, I love it when you talk about money, John. <laughs> Where is it that you're defensive? When you have courage to pray, God, show me any offensive ways in me, you know what? He'll show you. And then you say, God, would you bring healing? Will you forgive me? I want my, li I want my life, I want my heart to line up with your heart. I want to align my will with your will. Man, I want everything, God, that you have for me. <laughs> I want to be more Christ-like tomorrow than I am today. James chapter 4 says, Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. Maybe you're okay. Maybe you're okay with Satan stealing and killing and destroying your home, your health, your church, I'm not okay with any of that crap. I want to resist the devil. I want so much of God in my life that he has no room to infiltrate. Friends, when you live with a rebellious spirit, you are submitting to someone or to something. Why not submit your will to the Lord? Oh my goodness, what a way to life, live. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins. He will purify us. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. James says, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. This is why it's so important. Here at Crossroads, we talk about getting plugged in. We talk about getting connected. Start volunteering. So that you can go into Volunteer Central and meet other people that are heading towards God. Start contributing to your local church and to your community. Join a connect group. Come to celebrate recovery. Find places where you can connect with people who are heading towards God so that they can pray for you, so that you can be vulnerable with them, so that you can learn to love and to be loved. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test me. Where is it that I have fear? Where is it that I have anxiety? What's really going on? God, is there any offensive way in me? 
And God, I submit my future to you. Lead me in the way everlasting. God, I'm in it for the long haul. I am staying on this journey. No matter how steep the road gets, no matter how hot, how much I humanly want to sit down and watch life go by, no, 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 God, I commit to live for you. Lead me in your way everlasting. Help me to make every day count (laughs) until someday I see you face to face and you wipe every tear from my eye. And you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Man, that's my prayer for every one of you, is that you allow God to lead you for every day forward until you see him face to face. Would you please say this prayer out loud with me? Once again, Psalm chapter 139. And I I would encourage you, I would challenge you every day this week, pull out your phone or a Bible or or write it out on a card and put it up in your car or on your fridge, would you say this out loud with me? Pray this out loud. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's a dangerous prayer. Do you know what's even more dangerous? It's to never pray that prayer. Because friends, (laughs) when we ignore our heart, we compound our problems. When you ignore your heart, you compound your problems. So I don't know what message God had for you today. I do believe there's a reason. I believe there's a reason you're here. I believe there's a reason you're in Mishawaka, St. Pete, online. (laughs) I believe God was wanting to share with you some truth you can bring into your life. Friends, the most important prayer that you will ever pray is a prayer to receive Jesus. And I love it that here at Crossroads, often at the end of the message, we all out loud pray a prayer to receive Jesus as the leader and the savior of our life. And if you've never said that prayer, perhaps today could be your day. Today could be your day. And so I would love all of us out loud to just say this prayer in sincerity and in honesty. Jesus, I need you. I believe you are the savior of the world, that you gave your life to forgive my sins and that God raised you from the grave so that I could have eternal life. Thank you for loving me. I'm saying yes to you, Jesus. Come into my life. I will follow you. Amen. If that was a new prayer for you, if that was a prayer for you to say yes to Jesus, man, we would love to know about that. Uh, Pastor Keith is over here on my left, and you can come up and just share that with him. And man, he'd love to give you a fist bump, a high five, whatever it might be. Scripture tells us that whenever a human heart says yes to Jesus, there is a party, there is a celebration that goes on. And so if today was your day to say yes to Jesus, Pastor Keith, I would love to know about that. And could we just give a round of applause to anyone that said yes to Jesus today? You are amazing. You're amazing because God created you. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that God has given us today. Could I say a word of prayer? Jesus. May your grace, may your peace, may your truth, may your blessing (laughs) from generation to generation. May it be all over each and every person here at Crossroads. May we learn how to encourage each other. May we learn how to be vulnerable and authentic. May we learn how to have a heart for you above all else. So God, I I do pray, and I'm so grateful that you've given us today. Bless, bless these friends of mine, in Jesus' name, amen.